colleagues and welcome to the second session of the COVID-19 discussion forum convened by the Center for Human Rights. Uh, the, the aim of this forum is to bring staff, alumni and students of the Center for, for Human Rights from all our programs, uh, both academic and uh, civil society, to engage on issues affecting human rights on the continent and the general situation um, involving COVID-19 as this particular situation is ravaging the world and it's having quite a toll on the continent. As most of us are aware, many African countries have adopted a number of measures to sort of counter the impact of COVID-19 in, in the various countries. And um, we seek to discuss how some of these measures uh, either promoting or perhaps threatening or posing a threat to human rights on, on, on the continent. Hence the topic for discussion today, human rights under threat in Africa, question mark. Um, with me today to discuss these issues, we have uh, four colleagues, uh, alumni of the HRD program. Um, we have Dr. Azubike from University of Ilorin. I hope that's, that's correct, who will be talking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on education in Africa. We also have with us um, Dr. Shwani Madhu, who is our program's manager for the HRD program here with us at the Center for Human Rights. And she will be sharing her thoughts on freedom of expression and how COVID-19 has impacted um, this particular right. We have Ms. Petronel Kura uh, from the Bits University who will share thoughts on compulsory testing and how that can have an impact on human rights. And then finally, we have Samuel Ade from the University of the Gambia, um, who will also share with us uh, issues arising out of the impact of COVID-19 on prisoners' rights. Um, just as a, a few housekeeping issues, if you're not speaking, colleagues, would you please mute your microphone so that we don't have um, the background noise interfering with the presenter? We're also recording this conversation for our YouTube uh, channel and other social media networks so that we can have a clear sound um, without background interruptions. Um, at this point, I think we have already waited a bit. We have 44 participants at the moment in the room. So I will perhaps relinquish the seats and uh, hand over to Dr. Azubike. Just remember that we have eight to 10 minutes per speaker to um, provide a brief overview of, of the situation as related to that particular right. And then after all the four speakers have um, spoken, we will then have um, the opportunity to uh, ask questions, raise com uh, comments, and discuss um, the, the issues generally. But, uh, can I please ask participants who are not speaking to mute their microphones? There is a bit of interruption in the in the background at the moment. If you're not speaking, please mute your microphone. As I will hand over to you now. Okay. Um, okay, um, I'm trying to share my screen and it's saying you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. So I don't know if someone is on screen share. Uh, I was on screen share, but I can. Okay, uh, maybe you could turn off so that I could share. You can proceed as okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, good morning, colleague. Good morning. Today, um, I've been asked to speak on the impact of COVID nineteen on the right to education in Africa, and as a way of introduction, uh, if you look at what we have on the screen. I have 
pictures on the screen and of these four pictures, I'll try to direct my, my presentation in these four uh, paradigms. The first picture we have is the picture that has the wording saying, I am, I am not against online teaching, but what about us? So already I want us to be thinking about the implication of this. And on the bottom left corner of the screen, you will see the picture of a man and of a man uh, who are supposedly wearing a face mask. Um, and then in the middle of, of the pictures, uh, you would see um, a herbal medicine that has been claimed by the government of Madagascar to be cured for the coronavirus. And lastly, on the bottom right of the, of, of the screen, you will see uh, what I've called the toll on the rocks. So what are the implications of this, we might be wondering. First, I'll try to lay basic backgrounds about what we think um, education, uh, the, 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 in, the provisions of the law on education. And basically, we have several instruments, several treaties that talk about the right to education, even our various national constitutions. But I have zeroed in on three particular core instruments, which is the Article 26 of the UDHR Article 18 of the, um, of the African Charter of Human and People's Rights and Article 13 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So UDHR says everyone has the right to education and it shall be free, elementary and fundamental stages. The African Charter of Human Rights says every individual shall have the right to education. Article 13 of the Economic and uh, of, of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights says that state parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to education. They agree that education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and sense of its dignity and shall strengthen the respect for human rights. Now, if we flash back to the pictures I displayed earlier. In the first point, education has to be free. That's a fundamental right. And we see those kids that are looking at us because the in thing that you hear in the media these days is, oh, e-learning, people, when you talk to parents, they are telling you, oh, I'll get back to you. We are in classes, we are doing Zoom class, we are doing all sorts of, all sorts of things online. But are we really thinking that this comes within the purview of what the international law provisions and even some of our national uh, uh, legislations that provide for the right to education provide in this. So, what are the key concepts? First is access. From the we've looked at, how do we deal with access in these recent times? Do we think that it is every time? Af Nigeria, for instance, is said to have about 13 point something children that are out of school. So talking about seeing a gap that would widen when we introduce, when we look at the things that affect access, you talk about poor financing, you talk about non-availability, which is the second key concept. So we are getting into an era which is, which is not us that have made this era come. The COVID era has brought this upon us where we are afraid what will happen to access. In my village, for instance, quite a number of kids have never seen computers. They've never seen Android phones. Now we are talking about e-learning. We are talking about all modified forms of education to learn what becomes of them. So the issue of access and availability to us, you know, when we talk about the right to education is actually in, in some danger. The next is quality. The quality of non-availability of basic teaching materials, both for inclusive learning and mainstream learning, has been one that we have always grappled with. Now again, the question of quality. Uh, basically, you see so much fear about the issue of 5G, 5G, is it 5G, we are going to, what is it? How do we deal 
with the challenges of quality, even if we are able to deal with the e-learning processes. Acceptability becomes another core challenge that we are looking at. Basically, you will agree with me that it is not every community. We have seen some uh, videos and pictures of uh, some community leaders coming out to say, oh, we don't believe in what you're saying. Are we able to get these people to begin to accept to learn through computers and through the emerging uh, 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 technology that we are hoping we are going to use to disseminate education? Now, the nexus that we draw again with the pictures we've seen on the slide, where we see the, the man and the woman wearing underpants as face masks, it's because of lack of functional education, which we have seen in the three uh, provisions of articles we have talked about. So we have a whole lot of challenge in that, in that sphere. Looking at the, the concept of the, the toll on the rocks, when I saw the picture, I had put it up on my WhatsApp status. And in minutes, I had a number of people getting to me and saying, Doc, does it really work? And I, I got scared. I was like, oh, really? So people follow this thing, and if I say yes, somebody might just be drinking the toll on, 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 on some cubes, thinking oh, because it's coming from somebody who is knowledgeable, it works. So these are challenges that are there, and we know that our people don't have this understanding. A lot of people in sub-Saharan Africa will face these basic challenges. So how do we deal with this? Then another concept, the African concept of learning, which I have conceptualized in some papers, that it is more by learning by observation in informal settings. We have in our African system where we send people to go do apprentices, to go interact. So the African system of learning is one that has an informal structure that tries to, you know, that tries to bring into place the personal relationship but now we are talking about creating more gap and more distance. How do we deal with this? Children with disability. It's another major concept. Already I have, uh, in some places, argued about dropping the challenges of nomenclature on whether it's going to be inclusive or mainstreaming, or try to deliver quality education. In this context, how do we begin to deal with children with disability and the new paradigm of education that we are advancing and again not by our fault then relating to the picture on madagascar i come to indigenous knowledge it's everywhere in social media who, who rejects madagascar's solution um, drc is also said to have some herbal kill i've seen videos from some nigerians also screaming that will have found a herbal cure. But it's the new level of education that we are talking about going to embrace traditional knowledge. What is the challenge that it poses for traditional knowledge? Because here we are looking for vaccines, we are looking for whatever it is from the West. Again, we are coming up with another system of education that is going to take us away from what we are used to. So these are challenges, these are concepts that are evolving in this post-COVID uh, uh, era that would do, we, we, we really do like uh, scholars and practitioners to begin to engage with. How do we deal with traditional knowledge? How does the traditional knowledge find that disseminate this information? And then I move on to the options that are available to us. Do we need new laws? Do we, do we need new treaties? The challenges of progressive realization uh, um, according to Villeune in, in, in one of his works where he's argued that the argument of progressive realization should actually be used as a benchmark to monitor the progress of states and not as an excuse by states. So in this new era, there is economic downturn. We don't know how far it's going to go. The question again is, what would be the argument of our government in trying to provide the zero data access for e-learning, what is going to be the argument of government, are they going to provide students that are unable to access uh, technological gadgets to engage in this learning? What is going to, so 
governmental commitments. What are our governments ready to do? So uh, basically, I'm raising questions. I'm raising things that should agitate our minds. Some of I, I don't have answers at this time. And uh, they are forming part of an ongoing research and what I'm looking at. Then what is the role of parents? You would agree with me that it is not every parent that is computer literate. So you find a challenge where a parent doesn't have access to computer or even understands the need for computers. How would the parent now be able to guide the child, you know, to be able to embrace this new technology? Then a new inclusive approach. Uh, uh, if you look at Article 16 of the African Disability Protocol, which, uh, which has been adopted and which is now with us, how do we engage with it in, term, you know, in this emerging era to have a new scope of um, uh, inclusive education? And I also have the civil society engagement. What roles would the civil society uh, play in trying to engage and educate uh, the people? So basically, that is the thoughts I have at this time. Post-COVID-19 era, we have challenges. And like I listened uh, to the UN independent expert on solidarity, solidarity rights some days ago, say that this pandemic doesn't end for me until it ends for you. So we are in a space that we really need to know that the new education that is facing us is not going to be comfortable for me until it's comfortable for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Azu, for the presentation. I think you went a bit over time, but uh, we will grant you that access since you're the first speaker. But just to remind our subsequent speakers that you have about eight to 10 minutes, and we have a limited time to speak about these issues and also open the floor for general discussions from um, other participants. So following the, the format that was adopted in the first session, we would allow all the four speakers to speak and then we'll open the floor for discussion subsequently. So the, um, I will hand over now to Dr. Shwani to address us on the issue of uh, freedom of expression and how COVID-19 impacts on this particular right. Ashwani, over to you. Hi. Sorry, I could not unmute myself because you muted me. Um, so like Micah said, my name is Ashwani mm. and I work with the Center for Human Rights. Uh, the topic for today that I'll focus on is how um, COVID-19 is impacting on the freedom of expression of Africans. So as we all know, the coronavirus outbreak has brought the whole world to a standstill. The sole focus of different governments across the world at the moment is combating COVID-19. And they are all taking different measures to ensure that they feel the minimal effect of the virus. However, alongside the mountain of challenges that they are facing, fake news has become a source of frustration since they disseminate propaganda and disinformation and increase panic amongst the public. For instance, as you might already know, there have been fake news disseminated concerning homemade remedies, such as the consumption of alcohol or hot steam to kill the virus, news about the virus affecting only white people, testing kits being contaminated, vaccines being tested on Africans when they have not even yet been developed, um, shaving, riots, and fake videos concerning attacks on Chinese-owned businesses in Nigeria as a retaliation to discrimination against Africans in, in China. And this is just to name a few. Um, to ensure that fake news is not holding back countries in combating COVID-19, the countries are adopting or implementing very strict measures to combat fake news. Many African countries have been able to contain fake news by arresting or warning those spreading them. For example, um, in Mauritius, the Information and Communication Technology Act has been used to arrest someone who was propagating fake news about a riot. Um, in South Africa, the government has arrested those who are propagating the news that the virus was being spread by foreigners. And in Kenya, a man was arrested after he published false information with the intent to cause panic. And the list goes on. 
However, in the guise of strict controls to combat fake news, there's also the risk that African governments are, are violating the freedom of expression of Africans. Even before the COVID-19, many African governments were hiding behind legal provisions concerning labeling, libeling and defamation and had internet shutdowns. And this was already curtailing the freedom, freedom of expression of its citizens. And countries such as Cameroon, Egypt, and Uganda can be used as examples. And now COVID-19 is being used as a blanket means um, to escape uh, liability for such limitations. Um, I will now talk about the instances of violations of freedom of expressions using COVID-19. Um, in Mauritius, a woman was arrested for spreading fake news when she published a sarcastic meme against the government. In Tunisia, two bloggers who claimed corruption in relation to distribution of aid were arrested. And in Ethiopia, Egypt, Nigeria, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, there are increasing cases <clears throat> of arrests or attacks by law enforcement and security agencies on journalists covering the COVID-19 pandemic. And in Tanzania, <coughs> I'm sorry, a TV journalist was arrested for airing police brutality and the list again goes on. Um, these arrests or attacks act as a limitation to the freedom of expression of Africans. Recognizing that human rights are at the center of COVID-19, since its outbreak, many international human rights bodies or organizations have adopted statements or report relating to the protection of human rights. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on those that deal directly with the freedom of expression. To begin with, the World Health Organization and Human Rights Watch have issued human rights... <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so the World Health Organization and Human Rights Watch have issued human rights guidelines while implementing COVID-19 measures. And they also include freedom of expression of citizens, including that of the press. There are also several laws at the global and regional level that requires countries to uphold the freedom of expression of its citizens. Um, and this applies even in times of pandemics, unless the limitation is justified, as is in the case of containing fake news. Um, at the United Nations level, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects the freedom of expression of everyone and does provide for limitations. Measures to contain fake news during COVID-19 are permissible under Article 19.3b of the ICCPR since it is for the protection of public health. However, these limitations do not apply when someone is just expressing themselves about the measures that the government has taken without spreading fake news, as per General Comment 34 of the Human Rights Committee. Moreover, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression published a report on 23 April on disease pandemics and freedom of opinion and expression. <coughs> Amongst others, the Special Rapporteur emphasized that freedom of expression rights are critical to meet the challenges of the pandemic. This report recommended that states must still apply the test of legality, necessity, and proportionality, even in cases of public health threats, before limiting the freedom of expression of its citizens. Um, this recommendation indeed can be used to combat fake news, but, but must have a minimal impact on the freedom of expression. At the African Union level, freedom of expression is protected by Article 9 of the African Charter. The Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa issued a press statement on 8 April expressing concerns about internet shutdowns in African countries amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and recommended states to guarantee respect and protect of the right to freedom of expression and access to information through ensuring access to internet and social media services. He emphasized that states must not use COVID-19 as an opportunity to establish overarching interventions. Furthermore, on 17 April 2020, the African Commission published its revised declaration on principles of freedom of expression and access to information in Africa uh, that was adopted in 2019. According to this declaration, freedom of expression is an indispensable component of a democracy. And no one should be found liable for true statements, expressions of opinions or statements which are reasonable to make in the circumstances. <coughs> 
Hence, the arrest or attacks that are being made by government officials <coughs> in different African countries are against the African. <coughs> 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 I'm really sorry about <coughs> So, sorry. If we look at the provisions at the UN level or at the AU level, countries uh, should adopt laws concerning fake news, but they should not limit the freedom of expression of their citizens. Um, so as we can see, there are treaties and soft laws at the UN and AU level that require states to protect the freedom of expression of its citizens despite a pandemic. In that vein, it is recommended that if they have not already adopted such a provision, African states must clearly define what fake news are so that they do not frivolously charge citizens for spreading fake news. Moreover, they must ensure that journalists are not attacked or arrested for doing their job. States must also accept criticism and accept that journalists might not, journalists or their citizens might not have the same view as them as and when they are adopting measures. And finally, African governments must not use fake news during COVID-19 as a shield to violate the freedom of expression of its citizens and to carry out false vendettas that it might have had. So that's the end of my presentation, Michael. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ashwani, and uh, sorry for your discomfort. Um, hopefully it's not Corona in the, <laughs> you just have a dry throat. But um, colleagues, we will now turn over to Ms. Petronel Krua, who would speak to us about compulsory testing and what kind of impact it has on human rights. Uh, Petronel, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Michael, you'll just let me know if for some reason it isn't sharing. Um, good morning to everyone. And screen, so I'm sure it's visible to everyone. Thank you. Good morning to everyone and thank you so much um, for having me at this esteemed panel. So today I wanna to talk about compile testing. Now, you know, in this sort of new world of uh, corona or novel corona, testing has really been at the heart of a lot of discussion. And we've almost closed the loop on this issue where we started really with um, concerns about a lack of testing and a lack of availability of test kits. And that's still ongoing. But now moving towards a call for scaling up of testing or mass testing. Now, I'm sure in most jurisdictions, um, there has been some sort of communication from health authorities to scale up testing. And we see that at AU level, we now have PACT, so the Partnership to Accelerate COVID-19 Testing. And what is at the heart of accelerating testing, of course, will be... Um, to also ensure that those persons are tested who may not actually wish to participate in testing. So just a brief roadmap of where we're going today. I just briefly want to touch on the rights that will be implicated when we're talking about compile testing, where we usually see compile testing occur, how it would work in a situation like a pandemic, and then obstacles or questions that every government should be asking themselves when they want to tackle this issue. I mean, you know, I was going to talk about um, fake news today, but I think Dr. Boudot really just spoke about this very eloquently and set out one of the main issues that we have when we need to compel someone to test, force test, mandatory testing, testing without consent, whatever terminology you want to use, um, it basically is twofold. It's the spread of fake news and it's also a distrust in state authority. And, you know, the, the, the latter oftentimes being warranted. So, where we have situations where we have fake news and distrust, oftentimes you'll see in communities that there will be a reluctance of certain members of the community to assent to testing. And we have seen that in South Africa. And when we're talking about compulsory testing, it sort of is coupled with COVID-19 of discussions about forced um, quarantine, isolation, and treatment, of course. Um, and when we're talking about this, it's effectively, as always, a balancing of rights. So we want to balance the rights of the individual on the one hand with the rights of the community. So individual rights, privacy, security of person, bodily integrity, dignity, 
and then the rights of the communities uh, or of your community to basically have good public health. So just a breakdown of why I'm putting, you know, the right to access to healthcare or the best attainable mental and physical state here. When we look at that, it cuts both ways. So firstly, you know, your individual right to access to healthcare also includes freedoms, which would be the freedom not to be forced into any kind of invasive medical procedure. But on the other end of the spectrum, and here's just an example um, from the ICSCR, we see that the right to health also has a public health component where, you know, specifically it's the control and treatment of epidemics to ensure that everyone would be healthy um, in a, a society. I mean, we frequently see this discussion when we're talking about vaccines and whether or not to make them mandatory. So where do we usually see compile testing? And I mean, this will be different for every jurisdiction, but I mean, broadly speaking, you'll see issues of compile testing when we look at criminal cases where, you know, you might want to force someone to, after a sexual offense, maybe undergo an HIV test or, you know, a blood test to see, to, to link them with the specific crime that you allege they committed. Also frequently seen in paternity matters coupled with maintenance claims. And then, of course, especially on our continent, you know, pandemic situations isn't really new. I use the word notifiable diseases on my slide because that's just, you know, how we would speak about it in South Africa. The idea being, you know, that certain communicable diseases, um, specifically, you might want to compile testing to ensure that, you know, the public interest is being protected. And generally, there are a few observations that can be made from these realms about how compile testing works. And I think the most important observation here is that it's almost always done on an individualized basis. So what does that mean? It means when you compile someone to test, usually uh, your local test would be some form of a reasonable suspicion test or, you know, a prima facie test where whatever the purpose for the compiled testing is, there has to be some sort of factual nexus. So you can't just force everyone to undergo a blood test. There has to be some sort of link to the crime. You know, for paternity testing, we frequently see that there has to be some sort of factual nexus. Uh, you know, in Kenya, sort of adopting the Indian approach with this, where you have to show a factual nexus and a balancing of rights before courts will actually, um, you know, force someone to undergo a DNA test. And then another very important element is it is not always, but it is often coupled with a form of judicial control. So why am I talking about all of this? Well, let's quickly just pause on how, you know, in this particular state, um, compile testing could work in every country. And because it's impossible really to discuss the, the legal regulatory environment in every country. I just quickly used our South African example and don't be deterred, you don't have to read this. But just to illustrate that even, you know, in sort of these new extraordinary times of SARS-CoV-2, we see that we still have compile testing which is individualized, where a magistrate or a judicial officer has to um, apply some sort of an objective test. And this can be problematic and this raises a few questions that everyone should be thinking about. If we want to scale up testing, um, how will that work when the test still operates on an individualized basis? So we have to think of things. What does your current regulatory framework say about testing? So in South Africa, in my opinion, Right now, there is no legal basis to go out and do mass compile testing. You would have to go on an individualized basis, identify, let's say, 200 persons in a community who refuses to be tested and take those cases before a judicial officer, which is just impractical. So you need to look at your current regulatory environment. We need, to, as government specifically, needs to make sure that they have some sort of legal basis. If they have to rely on compile testing on a mass level, that they are in fact operating legally. And we have to ensure that community members are given accurate information so as to co-opt as much consent as possible when we have these mass community testing schemes. 
And then finally, we have to ensure that we have adequate training for healthcare practitioners so that when they are faced with a situation where you do not have communal consent for compile testing, that they know what the procedure is. And I think what's really important is that you need to have a clear legal framework for how a broader based compile testing situation would look so that you can build in sufficient controls to ensure that the aforementioned rights, so on my third slide, are still being protected as much as possible. So to try and ensure that compile testing isn't just an absolute act of force by the state, but that dignity, physical integrity, privacy is protected as much as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Petronel, for that uh, concise um, presentation. Again, I think I'll hand over now to Samuel, who will speak to us about the situation of incarcerated persons, the rights of prisoners, and how that is impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Samuel, if you're ready. I'm ready. Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> Someone can you like, hear me? I can hear you. You, you may proceed, someone. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Wairade, and uh, I'm with uh, the National Agency for Legal Aid in the Gambia. I also lecture at the University of the Gambia. I'm called upon to make a presentation on the impact of COVID-19 on the rights of prisoners in, in Africa. Actually, the, the topic of my presentation is a little uh, misleading, uh, requiring that I make a few clarifications before we proceed. It is important to note that uh, we have two categories of persons that are actually locked up in um, detention centers or in our correctional facilities uh, in the continent. And uh, the first group will be people I will call detainees. And this group are persons who are deprived of their personal liberty, but who have not been convicted of an offense. Uh, the second group will be prisoners. Prisoners are persons deprived of their liberties, but as a result of having been convicted for an offense. It is important to make this distinction at the very beginning of my presentation, uh, because as we go along the line, we're discussing about certain rights that accrue to this uh, group of persons. Some rights will accrue to one group and will not accrue to the other. Uh, I would try as much as possible to make these distinctions as I proceed with my, with my presentation. Uh, it is also important to note that uh, notwithstanding that persons deprived of their personal liberty and be them prisoners or detainees are still entitled to several rights which are protected by a host of uh, international uh, human rights instruments and regional human rights instruments, as well as uh, uh, national constitutions. And when we talk about international human rights instruments, we'll be looking at uh, the ICCPR, uh, the Convention Against Torture. And when we look at, uh, when we talk about those rights, we're looking at the African Charter on Human People's Rights, particularly Article 6 to 7 and uh, Article 16, as well as uh, the uh, Women Island Guidelines, uh, which talks about certain uh, uh, rights accruing to uh, people deprived of their personal liberty. Uh, just a brief background, I want to say that uh, on March 11, 2020, uh, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. Uh, prior to the declaration by the World Health Organization, uh, countries faced with huge rates of uh, infection and death had taken measures called emergency measures to curb the spread of the virus. Some of the measures included uh, shutting down of schools, shutting down of businesses, the banning of flights, uh, the employment of state of emergencies and curfews, which result in the shutting of entire cities and communities, 
the banning and limiting of measures of all manners of public and private gatherings, uh, limiting it to a maximum of five or 15 persons, uh, the encouraging of the wearing of gloves and face masks, and the frequent washing of hands. And last but not least, uh, uh, measures encouraging people to employ social distances. These measures uh, are motivated by the fact that the virus, the virus, that's the coronavirus, is mostly contracted through personal contact and spreads very rapidly in crowds. Therefore, personal contact must by all means be very limited, and crowds is a no-go zone. This brings me now to the question, why are we interested in persons deprived of their personal liberty? We realize that notwithstanding the measures taken by states, persons deprived of their personal liberty, particularly in Africa, face a heightened risk of contracting the dreaded virus, partly due to the fact that, uh, among other issues, detention and correctional centers across the continent are generally overcrowded, making it practically impossible to employ social distancing uh, measures. Secondly, uh, the hygienic and sanitation situations in our prisons and detention centers is deplorable, and such situations favor the spread of the virus. Uh, thirdly, and uh, not the least, most prisons and detention centers in Africa lack adequate washing facilities like soap, water, detergents, disinfectants, and others, which may assist uh, these persons deprived of their personal liberty to uh, uh, employ sanitation uh, uh, measures to avoid contracting the disease. Additionally, uh, I want to say that measures undertaken by states to curb the spread of the disease are not specifically impacting on the lives of those who are deprived of their personal liberty, such that those who are deprived of personal liberty have the likelihood of their rights being infringed by these measures taken by states. I will now indicate some measures undertaken by states, which have a very high probability of infringing on the rights of persons deprived of personal liberty, most particularly the right to a fair trial. Uh, some African states, including Botswana, Cameroon, Chad, Morocco, the Gambia, Egypt, Ivory Coast, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, uh, Mozambique, South Africa and Rwanda have placed a ban on or have suspended prison visits by family members and lawyers of detainees. While this measure is well intentioned towards preventing contamination by uh, detainees and prisoners by members from without these centers, they have a high probability of infringing on the rights of detainees to a fair trial. The right to a fair trial provides that a detainee should have access to his or her lawyer in a bid to adequately prepare for the trial of his or her case. If detainees are therefore not allowed to have access to their lawyers, their right to a fair trial is invariably being infringed. Article 7 of the African Charter on Human People's so Rights specifically provides that a clients, uh, detainees, or persons deprived of their personal liberty should have access to their lawyers. Uh, this is also provided in the Robben Island uh, guidelines. See, in the same vein, and to limit personal contact and avoid crowds, Algeria, Cameroon, uh, Gabon, the Gambia, Nigeria, Uganda, among others, have suspended judicial proceedings, save for very urgent applications before the court, applications that would deal with uh, personal liberty. The consequence is that more court houses are closed and hearings have been suspended indefinitely, leading to a probable violation of the tennis right to have their cases determined within a reasonable time. We should note that detainees and are presumed innocent unto proven guilty by a competent court of law within the required standard of proof in criminal trials. The continuous incarceration of detainees due to the suspension of judicial proceedings that amounts to a prison custodial sentence being safe, particularly when the detainee has not pleaded guilty to any offense or has been proved guilty according to law. This is a clear violation of the right of uh, these persons deprived of their personal liberty to a fair trial. 
This does not only limit to detainees. Prisoners who have been convicted have filed appeals. Those appeals are pending before the appellate courts of uh, most jurisdictions in Africa. With the courts being closed, there's a high probability that those appeals may not be heard for the next five, six, seven months, depending on the uh, duration which this uh, pandemic will take for courthouses are, are open. So you see how the rights of prisoners, particularly the rights to a fair trial, are heavily impacted by measures undertaken to curb the spread and to also uh, contain this uh, dreaded virus. Another important right which I will uh, mention before uh, I run up, I know I'm running a little bit out of time, but I'll try to summarize as much as possible, uh, is the right to health. The right to health is an inalienable right that uh, accrues to everyone without distinction. The right to health also requires that the government uh, provides, I beg your pardon, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, the rights of health also requires that uh, government take actions to prevent the spread of diseases and to improve sanitation and other aspects of hygiene. And when we are talking about prisoners or people detained or those deprived of their personal liberty, we see that they are actually constrained because they cannot fend for themselves. The government now has to provide every other thing for them, maybe medicines, uh, health services, and all the like. Being locked up in a place where uh, it's overcrowded, put the lives of these prisoners at risk. Without the right to health, which has been a hinge on the right to life, we find that uh, persons cannot really enjoy other rights as human beings. Now, how does this affect prisoners? Uh, the spread of the COVID-19 uh, of uh, the virus has gone into our place of detention and prisons, and we have had cases of infection uh, among inmates, particularly in, 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 in South Africa, uh, in Morocco, as well as in, in, in Tunisia. Uh, some of these uh, 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 contaminations have led to uh, protests leading to death of inmates and even to of some guards. Uh, I think I've run out of time, so I will, I will conclude. I will conclude virtually. Uh, Michael, please, for another two minutes. Uh, I just want to say, uh, all is not bad, all is not lost. We have seen African countries uh, taking measures specifically to prevent this 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 virus. This. Some of these measures, I will just list them out, serve as recommendations for other states to copy, uh, such that uh, when implemented, uh, the spread of the virus will be curbed very uh, seriously, and the rights of prisoners or those deprived of their personal liberty uh, will also be respected. Uh, one of the recommendations is the release of detainees awaiting trial. Uh, not that uh, detainees awaiting trial are presumed are presumed innocent and are not yet guilty. So uh, among those we within we released from prison who include uh, detainees awaiting trial. We have seen this done in, in Angola, in Nigeria, in, in, in Kenya, and in Libya. In the Gambia, uh, the National Agency for Legal Aid has been tasked with uh, making mass the applications to release those who are uh, awaiting trial. Uh, particularly those uh, accused of uh, petty crimes uh, attracting a prison sentence of less than three years or so. Another measure will be the reduction of prison terms. We have seen uh, Cameroon, Chad, Ivory Coast, uh, Morocco, uh, among other countries, uh, coming up with measures to reduce the term of imprisonment of some inmates. These have drastically reduced the prison uh, population. We have also seen the granting of pardon to to prisoners. Uh, on, on the 24th of April, the president of the Gambia uh, granted pardon to 140, some uh, about 140 prisoners, and they are soon to be released from prison. We have also seen countries like uh, uh, Libya, Burkina Faso, 
releasing children, the sick, and elderly from prison. This is a very recommended uh, move because the, these categories of persons uh, are very, very vulnerable. Uh, putting them in the prisons uh, increases their risks of contamination of the disease. We have also seen, uh, like in Kenya, uh, measures implemented which uh, uses alternative sources or alternative methods of uh, uh, incarceration, house arrest. Uh, people who are convicted are placed on, on the house arrest rather than taking them to the already overcrowded jails. And we have seen the, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Justice uh, coming out with uh, seculars that unless it is absolutely necessary, uh, no other person uh, accused of an offense should be incarcerated. Even those who are convicted now uh, will hardly be sent to, to prisons that can be placed under house arrest. We have also seen the provision of basic health and sanitation materials to inmates. All these measures, if countries will implement uh, or rather, uh, employ a combination of two or three will help very much in reducing the uh, prison population and curbing the spread of the virus while also respecting the rights of uh, persons deprived of their personal liberty. Thank you very much. I'll end for here and I hope I can give more explanations uh, when answering questions. Mike, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for that presentation and I apologize, colleagues, for exceeding the time that was originally allocated, but I'm sure you will uh, appreciate that uh, the speakers have uh, utilized uh, the time quite well and exhaustively discussed uh, most of the issues. Um, we will now open the floor for questions, discussions, and comments. And I will start from the, the chat, the public chat. Um, Adi Kulibali had a question for Dr. Azubike. So Adi, if you can repeat your question for the purpose of uh, the broader audience. Um, what exactly did you want class of the clarification on from Dr. Azubike? Yeah. And then. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, perhaps we could uh, carry out more research about the inequities in our education systems. And uh, one issue I raised is the silence of governments. I feel maybe they could have provided some guidelines to caregivers on how they can handle the education needs of students. Um, how do we encourage that or what, can, what role can we play in that regard? Okay, uh, thank you, Adi, for the question. And um, I think something that we need to see from what is happening is the challenge. And uh, when I spoke about government's commitment, this was basically what I was uh, trying to drive at. What is, the, but when you look at the political economy challenges and the transfer of responsibility from our various governments to the citizens. In Nigeria, for instance, the government has come out to say that banks and government workers can go back to work from the 4th of May. Nothing has been said about schools. The as, minister- as you, I think you're sharing the wrong screen. No, I'm not sharing the wrong screen. Um, I'm sharing this screen purposely because um, here, when I talked about the parental responsibility, someone had shared the, the, the meeting login details with a parent and this was the response. And the parent says, I'm sure that you know Zoom is China's product, that every discussion done in any part of the world, it's in their headquarters. So you, you, see, you see the layback, there is already a lashback. People wouldn't now even want their children to sit in front of Zoom that they are having e-learning because they feel China is up to something. We all know the, the 5G conspiracy theories, that we have uh, set out and a lot of things. So these are challenges. I, I agree with Adi. And also, the, um, somebody had asked me privately what I think about, oh, government is using TV stations and they are using radio stations. And I've, I've reacted and I've said, look, we've talked about the African system of education that talks about communalism. I remember a few, when the corona lockdown started, I saw some kids in my area going to an Islamic school. And I, I called the parents, I said, look, this thing we are talking about is serious. These kids need to stay at home. And the woman looked at me and said, but they are going to learn the Quran. So you're beginning also to have, see a challenge that is going to come post COVID. How do we 
uh, uh, convince scholars in, in certain dimensions. I'm sure at some point we'll have somebody that will speak to our religious needs uh, uh, post-COVID. So these are challenges that um, I, I don't know what the government wants to do. In Nigeria, government said, oh, universities should go online teaching. And somebody says, how many universities have video conferencing facilities? So these are challenges. And I don't know if government is running away from this responsibility. And that is why already I, I, I begin to say that they must not give us the progressive realization excuse, but rather adopt a positive interpretation to the question of progressive realization. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as we, um, we had another question from Milka. Uh, Milka, can you repeat your question just for the purpose of the audience? You would have to unmute your mic first. Okay. Would you like to repeat your question, Milka? Or, well, so the, the question that Milka was asking relates to the issue of compulsory testing among marginalized communities and um, the issue of um, clashes between the need to protect these communities, but also the, the rights of, of these uh, communities. And Milka wants further and deeper discussion on this issue as to how the, does compulsory testing affect marginalized uh, communities. Um, so Petronel, if you'd like to take um, up this particular question. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Molka. I mean, I think that's, you know, such a, a really important thing that we need to discuss moving forward, especially, you know, when we're talking about any type of, you know, invasive medical measure, whether it be treatment, uh, isolation, quarantine, testing. Uh, one thing that I found interesting, and this is now speaking across from a South African perspective, and I wonder how everyone, you know, in their respective jurisdictions have experienced this. We, in normal pandemic situations or where we have a notifiable disease, um, there's actually usually a counseling requirement that's coupled with any form of compiled testing before it's before a judicial officer. And what I found very interesting is with our disaster regulations, which, you know, is tailored for COVID-19, that element has gone missing. And I actually think, you know, that would be the point of departure when we're trying to engender trust with communities is before, you know, taking vast measures such as, such as compiled testing, I think we need to um, have a twofold approach, which is first sharing information accurately and being truthful and, you know, engendering trust. And then secondly, having open lines of communication so that we can ensure that we avoid situations where we actually have to compile testing in the first place. Thank you. Uh, Petronel, uh, before you leave, um, there was a second question from Lord Atkin on compelled vaccination. Um, in, in, in the situation of a pandemic where there's potential public health consequences, what do you think uh, could be the implications for compelled vaccination if a vaccine is um, so, discovered? So, I mean, I think this is, we have to be very context specific with this. So um, I think firstly, it would be important for us to get more medical information and, and to see firstly how herd immunity in different countries actually develop and if that might be sufficient to allow certain individuals who might have you know beliefs surrounding vaccinations that would make it difficult for them to actually comply with vaccinations to see if that herd immunity can cover those individuals um, and then secondly to see you know if COVID actually does reinfect so right now we know that if you have the virus but the disease doesn't actually realize you can get the virus again, but it seems as if like preliminary medical studies have shown that once the disease is actually manifested, you cannot get the disease again. So if you have a situation in the country where you have a mass opting in um, for vaccinations and you already have herd immunity, I'm always very reluctant to force anyone to undergo any type of medically invasive test, but at the same time, 
I think that there are situations where compulsory vaccinations might be required to protect the more vulnerable in our society. But that would be a discussion that differs from country to country um, based on how you know, the COVID-19 spread occurs within each country. Thank you, Petronel. Um, Eric had a question. Would you like to repeat your, your question, Eric? I'm not sure if, okay, Eric is here. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can, we can hear you, Eric. Good morning. My question related to the situation prevailing in my country, Burundi, but it may also be prevailing elsewhere on the, the continent. Currently, we are uh, in a, an electoral camp, campaign, and uh, it is still the government want to avoid any dramatization of the pandemic. This is to excluding some private media from attending the briefing. Of course, there are many other limitations to freedom of expression, but I just wanted to know the view of Dr. Chuane on the politicization of the pandemic on the continent whether it has also led to, to, to the restriction of the freedom of, of expression. Thank you. So um, I, I did a bit of research on Mauritius uh, prior to this. And um, so in Mauritius, while the prime minister is giving a pre, uh, press <clears throat> briefing, it's only um, the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation, like state-owned media that's allowed to be there to receive information. So there's been a bit of debate about why we are not allowing other media companies to have access to these media briefings and ask questions. And there've been the instance of like um, one of the radios, one of the radio stations we had for uh, lost its license for two days because of reporting something back in November, 2019. So politicization of the pandemic, if not uh, like it's very common across African countries. Um, I think in this situation, like what, what South Africa is doing is actually very good because you have representatives from all different media who have access to the press briefing. And unfortunately, um, apart from putting pressure on the government, apart from writing about it, apart from debating about it, there's not much that can be done. But if you have a progressive judiciary, um, it is actually something you can take up to the judiciary and, and, and talk about the press briefings. Uh, the fact that the press briefings do not include you leads to a, to a limitation on the freedom of expression. Um, I know back home, like in Mauritius, there was a case where, so um, if this is not in relation to freedom of expression. It's really right to counsel. So um, for the lady that I mentioned who was arrested in, so it's, all, it's, it's very political. So the lady who was arrested was part of the opposition and she put a meme or something. And when her councils went to the station, they were booked. So now she could not have representation. So they went to court to ask whether like, um, it, to, 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 to get a ruling from co the court that it is actually unconstitutional for someone to be booked uh, and not have right to counsel when someone has been arrested by the police. So in this case, the judiciary was actually progressive and did um, ask the government to amend the regulations to ensure that people have right to counsel. So if you have a progressive judiciary, you can make changes, but up, uh, otherwise it has to be campaigns. You have to keep writing about it um, and to make mention about it. Uh, thank you, Ash. I think Barbara had a question for Samuel. So, Barbara, if you'd like to ask your question. Hi, Michael. Hello. Uh, hi, Barbara. You can, you can proceed to ask the question. We can hear you. Yes, my internet is unstable. But, um, so what I was saying is that in Uganda, he was talking about prisoners' rights. And in Uganda, the Chief Justice issued uh, guidelines pertaining to the handling of prisoners. Sorry? Hello? Hello? Yes, Barbara, you can proceed. 
Yes, I was getting feedback. So, he, and he was telling lawyers to buy bundle, data bundle, so that they can help their prisoners um, to represent them in court. But lawyers are also saying that, look, we need food in our homes. We don't have money for bundle. And so I was just thinking that, is it maybe that we should now, as the justice sector, maybe across Africa, start thinking about working with technology? How can the legal profession, how can the justice sectors and you know the private actors um, providing justice solutions use um, technology to enhance access to justice for vulnerable people um, in Africa. So it's really going around that. Yeah. That how can we tap into technology to enhance access to justice for vulnerable groups with protecting their privacy and you know, related rights. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Samuel, would you like to take up this one? Is uh, Samuel still with us? Okay, I don't, I don't see Samuel on the call at the moment. Um, we'll move to the next issue. Um, he is here, and I think he's talking, but we can't hear him. Um, somewhere you would have to unmute your microphone. Hello, somewhere. Can you hear us? Because many of the questions were actually geared uh, towards Samuel. There's another one from Eunice, there's one from Godfrey, which also is to Samuel. But well, whilst we're waiting for Samuel, Ashwani, there was a, there was a question from Sule for you. Um, Sule, would you like to um, proceed to ask your question to Dr. Ashwani? Hello? Yes, so that you can proceed, we can hear you. Okay, you can hear me. Good morning, everybody. I want to have an insightful presentation to the chat, but I really don't know. My question is the freedom of um, expression. So my question is, um, I think your internet is a little we cannot hear you. Hello, Sule, can you hear us? Yes, Sule, your, 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 your internet might be a bit slow, so you were really, really inaudible. Um, if you can hear but us. I think, but I think I can, the question is already written there. Okay. Um, I can try and answer it. So that's the problem with COVID-19. It's very easy for someone to cause panic about the virus. And this is what governments have been struggling with since the start of the virus, like drawing the line between fake news and freedom of expression. So um, for me, uh, reconciling with this issue might be, um, so as you would have noted, I approached the discussion from a fake news point of view, how states are battling to contain fake news. And we've seen in the case of the Kenyan person, who was trying to cause panic, who was arrested. So government need to be very clear about what constitutes fake news and what not. 
so that um, they don't use the fake news provisions when someone is just expressing themselves. I don't know if that answers your question. Very well, Ashwani. Uh, Linda had a question for Dr. Zubike. Uh, Linda, you may proceed with your question. Yeah, uh, my question, Dr. Azubike, um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. But I would like to know your opinion concerning the recent press release from the Education Secretary that says that um, um, those schools that are writing to parents stating that um, the, they should resume the third term or starting online class, they should stop their act and then stated that um, for the fact that they don't want the whole curriculum to be distorted, that the government's third term hasn't started. So schools should stop, that's a private school now, they should stop um, doing the online classes until the government says they should proceed with that. I want to know your, 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 your take on this uh, implication as to the freedom of education. So if, um, a school that has the means of the electronic um, access to children or children that are willing to even attend those class when the government come in to say they shouldn't proceed with um, such just because it's going to affect the, its calendar. So I want to know what you, your take on, on it. Thank you. Yes, I, Azu, that is directed to you. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. I think uh, the question is quite thought-provoking. But again, I I'll go back to the, to the rudiments. If we look at Article 17 of the African Charter, we look at Article 26 of the UDHR, we look at um, Article 13 of the ICESR. Government has a responsibility to ensure. So there is a responsibility placed on the government both to promote and fulfill and also protect. So we must not allow a space where a certain few, for me, would say, oh, I can afford this, then I can start going to school, or I can start doing my on online lessons. But again, I have argued, some of these private institutions that we have, are they really uh, uh, seeing education as a right, or are they seeing it, monetizing it? There is this monetary perspective to availability of education. And let us not take it for granted that it is not all the students in those schools. Some of those schools just want students to pay their fees so that they can have money. And that, that is, for me, the reason why some of them are saying, oh, we are opening up for third term. Once you say we are opening up for third term, they will start asking the students to pay, to pay for their school fees before they will have access to these online facilities. And then you talked about something that it's also very key that we must that that we must take into cognizance when we talk about the right to education and in education willingness willingness when 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 we say the child doesn't have the willingness to go to school there is an obligation on the state to ensure so the aspect of ensuring means a way of ensuring that the child goes to school so it's not just a question of willingness now uh, it might be a different discourse if we have to talk about whether it has to be structured education or it has to be informal education or, or, or a semi-formal education. But I, I think the question of willingness is one that if we embrace can only increase the gap between accessibility to education rather than COVID. So for me, I think the government is trying to do the right thing so that there is no gap. Because once this gap is increased, then a whole lot, a, a several number of children will be left behind. And down the years, the children you have not educated will turn around to haunt you. Uh, thank you, uh, Azu. Um, somewhere there were a number of questions that were directed at you. Um, the first one was from Barbara, who wanted to know how the use of technology can be utilized uh, in accessing uh, justice for persons who are incarcerated, bearing in mind issues like privacy and, and other rights that may be impacted. So if you're ready to 
address that particular issue. And then there are a number of other questions that had been asked uh, specifically to you that would come to subsequently. So Samuel, over to you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I, we can hear you now, Samuel. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Barbara, uh, for, your, for your question. Uh, I just want to first of all start by saying that we are living under on unprecedented times wherein court proceedings are suspended uh, across the continent. I, I think this, this is a good move to avoid uh, personal contact and to curb the spread of the dreaded coronavirus. However, uh, I also know that um, difficult times like this uh, provoke uh, uh, measures which we must adopt to be able to uh, protect the rights, particularly of, of prisoners. We have had situations in uh, particularly Rwanda where court proceedings are going on by Zoom or other so virtual platforms and cases are disposed in that, in that manner. Uh, the, the Gambia is uh, about adopting uh, that kind of system where uh, very urgent applications, particularly dealing with the bail of accused persons who are under detention or remandees, may have, must, must proceed. Uh, the personal liberty of persons are very, very important. We, it, it is unacceptable to continue to keep someone locked up when the person has not been convicted and sentenced for an offense. It is a gross violation of his or her right. Therefore, oh, the only thing that can be done is to call on the, the stakeholders, lawyers, uh, 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 to do everything possible to be able to represent their clients. In the, Gamba, in the, in the Gambia particularly, the daunting tax of representing those on pretrial detention to assure their personal liberty is on the National Agency for Legal Aid. And I'm sure every country on the continent has a national agency for legal aid. Uh, they are civil servants and they are paid from the state funds. They don't need to complain about uh, bundles, uh, internet bundles. I know most of the uh, clients under pre-trial detention are in a very difficult situation because they don't have the means. Those who can even afford to pay a, 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 a lawyer, uh, that lawyer is normally supposed to have enough finances to be able to uh, uh, buy internet bundles. But those who don't have the means to pay a lawyer, and that lawyer is given to them by the state, the state has made sure that the lawyer is able to carry out uh, virtual proceedings in representing his or her client. So I, I don't think it is, it, is, it is an issue. It's just the willingness. The willingness. I think uh, lawyers will make a lot of noise, but any uh, diligent lawyer will realize that this moment calls for extra sacrifices to secure the rights of the clients. But thank you very much. Yeah, there was another question from Eunice who wants to know about um, prisoners awaiting uh, trial. <clears throat> um, I'm sure you touched on it uh, in, in the presentation, but yes, I, what, I, what I, exactly I, was your recommendation? For this? My recommendation was that uh, prisoners or detainees awaiting trial are presumed innocent. The continuous incarceration of such categories of persons is a violation of their right to a fair trial and a violation of the right to personal liberty. Okay, uh, a lot of countries have realized this and have included uh, prisoners awaiting trial in the list of uh, people who are supposed to be released conditionally. Conditionally means they are released on bail. Then it is not said that they are, uh, they are innocent. It is said, okay, based on the circumstances in which we find ourselves, we are... Hello? Hello? Samuel, you can proceed. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I was distracted by that noise in the background. I was saying that countries like Angola, uh, Nigeria, and Kenya, specifically, even Libya, have released most of 
the prisoners awaiting trial, particularly those awaiting trial for petty offenses that attract a lesser sentence between three to five years, or between one, one to five years. Other countries have decided that those accused of uh, felonies, uh, big, uh, rape, defilement, treason, uh, armed robbery, those uh, uh, offenses that carry a much heavier sentence will not benefit from such measures. Okay, because uh, actually this, a lot of these things are violent crimes. What a petty, petty offense is, somebody was arrested for stealing a goat because of, 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 of hunger, and you want to keep that person locked up. You know, we also are conscious of the fact that uh, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, uh, in collaboration with OSIWA, have come out with a guideline on the glass, declassification of petty yeah, offenses and finding alternative, alternative measures wherein instead of locking up uh, 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 violators of petty offenses, they should be sent to, to, to farm, production farms, or to place on the community level. These are other measures which can be used, rather than uh, uh, locking up these categories of, of petty. Yes, uh, Samuel, while at that, there was a question relating to the right to food for prisoners, especially those in detention centers, because in some instances, uh, persons who have not been convicted yet relies on food most times exclusively from visits from their family members. And in instances where countries have prescribed the ability of um, prisoners to receive visitors, um, how does that impact on the right of prisoners, especially those who are awaiting trial, to food? We, we, we have two categories of prisoners who are awaiting trials, or detainees who are awaiting trials. The first are the Mandis. These ones are in the correctional centers or prison facilities. The second are those who are still in police stations. Uh, it is difficult uh, when you refuse such visits from family members who will come with, even not only food, with medicine. Yes, you see the, the health rights of these prisoners are actually, or these detainees are heavily impacted. Okay, secondly, uh, what the government is supposed to do, which is a problem across Africa is that the prisons, uh, those in prisons do not have adequate food. It is even compounded by the COVID-19 virus, wherein uh, there's a shortage of provision and which have caused riots in a lot of uh, prisons across the continent. This is just a clear indication that uh, governments in taking these measures to curb the spread of the virus did not adequately prepare to protect basic rights of their citizens, particularly those whose rights to personal liberty has been rest rest restricted, those in uh, prisons and those in detention centers. So I, I think what the government can do, not only the government, NGOs can do and civil society organizations can do, is to see where there is a gap, where the government is failing grossly particularly relating to prisons, and step up their efforts to provide uh, provision. We have seen in other countries where bags of rice, uh, 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 cooking oil, and other cooking uh, 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 accessories have been uh, provided to prisons to assist, to ensure that prisoners have adequate uh, food and nutrition with this time. There is also a question on the fact that many you know, judges are quite conservative and whether we genuinely think that they would be willing to use technology as the means of administering justice, especially if we have older judges who are not, you know, tech savvy, how do we perhaps encourage them and uh, get them to be more open to using technology as the means of um, dispensing justice in this, in this period? Uh, my, uh, Michael, uh, desperate times call for desperate measures, okay? Uh, nobody called for the COVID-19 virus to spread the way it is spreading and in killing hundreds of thousands of people in the way it is doing it. It is, it, it is in the interest of judges that social distances is maintained. It is to protect them also against contamination uh, of, the, of, of the virus and against their families and loved ones. So I, I think that consciousness that it is not about me, it's about my loved ones, it's about uh, my family, it's about the society that some of these measures are being taken. 
Notwithstanding that the measures are infringing on the rights of a particular category of people like uh, detainees, you should also understand. One thing I've realized is that to some judges who are very conservative, particularly those who refuse bail in a in situation where it is clearly provided that bail can be given to this person, are those judges who have not had their loved ones locked up for a long time. When it comes close to home, the mindset changes. I don't wish that a uh, uh, person should be affected negatively by these measures or by the, uh, the, the, the coronavirus for them to come to the consciousness that they can do these things. There is nothing harmful staying in your home or staying in your chambers and having a video uh, conference setting where you listen to the submissions of parties in a particular case. Actually, judges are being encouraged not to go to open court, but to have sessions in their chambers where the distance of at least two, two meters can be maintained between uh, advocates for the state and for any uh, uh, accused person. So I, I think we just have to call on judges to, to, to step up and do what they are actually called to do for the interests of, of justice and for the society. Uh, thank you, Sam. There are a few more questions that are directed to you. There's a question from Fatu Salah. Fatu, would you like to ask your question? And then there are a few other people who have raised their hands. I'll come to you shortly. Uh, Fatu. You would have to unmute your mic, Fatu. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, it's, uh, my question is directed to Samuel. Um, I wanted to know what the plan or what the packages were, if any, about the released prisoners. Because um, from my experience, a lot of the prisoners most often do not really have a family to go back to or like face a high risk of stigma. And then given the present lockdown measures, um, I doubt they would find any means of livelihood. So I just wanted to know from the countries that you highlighted, are there any like measures put in place for these released prisoners? Especially in the Gambia, particularly in the Gambia. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fatu. Uh, your question is very, very, very important, uh, I must say, and brings to light uh, all those issues which are not uh, put into consideration when government adopts some of these measures of releasing prisoners. Notwithstanding, I want to say that uh, once you are convicted of an offense and you are locked up in a prison facility, you are entitled to take part in any of the recreational activities or recreational training uh, options that are available in prisons. I'm sure most of our prisons have uh, training centers for uh, a kind of vocational activities, maybe sewing, tailoring, wedding, uh, computer repairs, uh, satellite repairs, and other stuff, which are often to mostly prisoners, those who have been convicted of offense and are saving time. So uh, there is no one that has been released who has just imprisonment. Those who have been released are those who have at least spent a majority of the prison term they were supposed to serve in detention. In Nigeria, in Nigeria, those who are being released are those who have spent at least half of their imprisonment term. I think in, uh, uh, in one, other, one other country, it is those who have at least 18 months left of their imprisonment term, that's one year, six months, which means they must have spent a lot of time in prison. And within that term, they must have learned a trait. If they're being sent out into the society now because of uh, uh, measures which are taken to curb the spread of the virus, it is incumbent on them to go and apply that trade which they have learned while in detention. For that was the initial purpose um, of well, having I, those. I, I think the, the concern of uh, Fatu is if there are lockdown measures which prevents people from actually engaging in a trade or profession uh, such that you cannot earn an income even if you are out and a prisoner is just released into the society where they actually don't have any means of income. And in yeah. some places where their families may have shunned them because of 
you know, the perceived shame that they might have brought onto the family. What is the survival uh, mechanisms that, you know, states think that these particular prisoners would have when they actually cannot engage in any profession because there are lockdowns or other restricted movements. So, you know, the economy is such a, it's constrained in a way that does not allow all the possible trades that they had actually may have a length in prison. I think that's, that's, that's what Fatu was getting at. How do this? Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah, uh, it's a very complex situation, Mike. Uh, Fatu, we must accept that it's a very complex. Uh, I first of all want to indicate that we have had situations where prisoners are released at the term of their prison, uh, of their imprisonment, and they don't know where to go to. They don't have a family, they don't have any means of subsistence. So they don't have anything to do. They prefer to stay back in the prisons where they can have two or three square meals a day because they don't know how they're going to survive outside. Now we're looking at a situation where a huge proportion of such prisoners are sent out, wherein there is a lockdown and they cannot even employ that whatever trade they have, they have, they have, they have learned. Just have to depend on the, the benevolence of society in accepting these people who have been released. The go I've not seen any government who, who have, well, that actually prepared a package, a financial package, to give to these people who are being released. It is understandable that they'll be taken care of by their families when they go back home. So the, the situation becomes very uh, precarious for those who don't have a family to go to. There are exceptions to every situation. And I think that is where civil society comes in. That's, when, that's where we have NGOs coming in to lend support to this particular group of persons. Because the uh, government cannot really do all. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel. I, I think we had two hands up. And then they, in the interest of time, there has been suggestions by colleagues that uh, the questions that are directed to specific speakers, uh, the speakers can read from the chat and respond rather than asking yeah. the individuals to repeat the questions because we, have, we are far behind time. So um, I will ask the colleagues who have raised their hands. The first is Ngozi to ask her question, and then there's David Osita, and then subsequently, uh, you, Dr. Azubi, a number of questions for you in the chat, which you can respond to, and then we can close the session. So Ngozi, um, you may proceed to ask your question. Your hand was up. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Actually, my question goes to Dr. Azubike. Sorry, I came in a bit late because of network instability. So I want to know his take on how we can realize access to education for children in special schools, particularly in Nigeria. You know, assuming, just ensure they, that they are not left behind, assuming the, this aspiration for online teaching is eventually achieved in Nigeria, knowing that these children require special measures, measures particularly for visually impaired learners and even for the hearing impaired students. So, and other students that have sensory disabilities, how do we ensure that they are not left behind? Thank you. Thank you, Ngozi. Uh, David, you, might, you, you can proceed to ask your question. You have to unmute yourself, David, before we can hear you. So, okay. Is that for me also? Do I hold on? Um, perhaps let's um, ask David to, to proceed first, and then if it's for you, then you can proceed to answer all the rest, and then we can close. Obviously, thank you. My question is directed to uh, Mr. Samuel Azu. Um, obviously, uh, we've seen the provisions, uh, Article uh, uh, 16 of Africa, the Charter of Human Rights. Yeah. Obviously, um, the issue of the incarcerated is a very complex one. I really appreciate uh, the way you really uh, dissected everything, but I have a concern, obviously. Most of the people that were released, their release was based on the benevolence of the prerogative power of the executive, isn't it? But we expect that when these people were released, something would have been made, set aside for them, peculiar 
COVID-19 palliative for the released prisoners. We went to the correctional center. Nothing possible was made available for them, only for them to come out of the prison and started unleash mayhem. On innocent people, children that were out of school, we are raped. They get themselves, in, they, 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 there was rape. confusion. You could have heard of the one million man show, gangsters, because when these people were released from the prison, no provision was made for them. And they had to start to unleash alcohol. Not until the government now muster the security apparatus to be able to forcefully engage these people. Mr. Samuel, how can you reconcile this to freedom for the incarcerated and the freedom and the right of the innocent, the vulnerable? Yeah, I, I think we've. So, we've, how can you reconcile the two? Uh, Samuel, I think you can quickly answer this and then uh, you yes. have to be excused since you have to be in court. And then Dr. Azubi yes. can answer the questions and we'll close it off because we are we far exhausted at the time that we, we are located. So please, Samuel, quickly and then Dr. Azubi. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I just wish to say that uh, in a situation like this, we have competing rights. And we look at uh, the society as a whole. Uh, and we, governments will normally uh, balance rights and see which rights to protect more. We are in emergency situations. Governments have declared a state of emergency, a state of health emergency. We don't want a situation where the entire population dies from the contamination of this uh, dreaded COVID-19. So it's, uh, I'll just simply say it's, a, it's, a, it's the situation of the balancing of rights. Would you prefer to have these people in prison with a very high likelihood of them being in, uh, contaminated with the disease and all of them dying. These are people who also have human rights and their rights to health must be protected. This is a period where government have called on lockdown. Normally we expect people to stay at home. Governments have also put curfew measures in place. After 6 p.m., after 7 p.m., everybody is supposed to be at home. If you find yourself out of your house within this time, you don't want to put the blame on the government if something bad happens to you. We have uh, security operatives still working full time. These are the only sector which has not been impacted very much by the coronavirus. While other sectors have scaled down on the amount of persons that come to work, the security sector has actually scaled up. People have been called to work extra hours because they have to protect this, the, this, the, the public against unfortunate situations. I think uh, uh, I have answered your question at least to, to an extent. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. And I, I think we can actually excuse you now since you have to run. Uh, and I, Dr. Azubike will take over with the rest of the questions. And I think Petronel had a few final points and then we'll close up. So uh, Azu, if you would make this uh, a minute or so. Yeah. so uh, can... Thank you. Uh, I think all the questions are quite interesting. and. I'm happy because this is raising thoughts in our mind. And I don't have answers to some of these questions. And these are the challenges that we are wanting people to engage with. So, for example, uh, Lord Atkins asked, asked about universities being asked to go uh, and embrace online teaching. Now, the response I would give here would be uh, a previous Vera Chua Award at the Center for Human Rights. Um, uh, Mr. Jojo Kobina, who is based in Ghana, had once shared, you know, from his investigative journalism, a teacher who was meant to be teaching primary school children computer and didn't know, was calling the, the monitor, the CPU, and calling the CPU, whatever name. We have, we have these challenges. How many of university academics are even computer compliant? Some are still analog. So you're asking them, oh, go and start teaching online. They don't have these tools. They don't know these tools. So how do they do this? Um, the data challenge is there. I, I was listening to news yesterday, and I was impressed with Edo State saying that they are going to be giving zero data to the 
public schools to engage in online learning, which is a good one. Would that be the same for universities? I quite know that it's not all university students that can afford that are to engage in online learning. So what would they do? Iabo's question and Ngozi's question on inclusive education, I think I agree basically with Iabo that government has a responsibility to ensure. That is what the three instruments, Article 17, Article 26, says it is government's responsibility so they cannot abdicate this to private individuals and i have argued on this particular issue with hanson gule on the human rights and the human capital nature of the right to education and it's clear i mean aligning with the um, uh, fees in education thesis by katrina tomozeski it's basic this is government's responsibility to provide education we cannot just leave it in the hands of private citizens who, who monetize education and then we increase the gap. Uh, David asked, uh, made an interesting intervention about the one million boys. I've argued also in some other quarters that because of the gap in education we have, that is what brews crime. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line, the children that we would have excluded from assessing education, because remember, education is supposed to reorientate the mind. Article 26 says education makes the child to be able to contribute meaningful to the development of the society. So when we don't do this, what are we bringing? I mean, it, it, it's, it's challenges for us. And um, Bumi talked about IDPs. Can we suspend the right to education? It brings the question of civil and political rights as against economic rights. Which do we go for? Are we going to suspend elections? Are we going to suspend elections in Nigeria? Are we going to suspend elections? I, I know some, um, was it Mali, that went on with their elections? So suspending the right to education, I don't think it, 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 it's it. But what can we do? I think we should be able to engage the spe various special mechanisms that we have. I mean, at the African Commission level, we have the special repertoires, we have the independent experts, we have the Center for Human Rights, what you're doing now at, in my university, at the University of Illori, we have the Disability Law Advocacy Project and several other networks. We all have to come together. There is no suspension of these rights because I tell you that the right you suspend for one minute can cause us a whole lot of ripples. Uh, we are beginning to talk about right to life, right to our properties and all of that. So it's a critical time. I agree with Ade on that. It desires critical moments. And that is why in my initial presentation, I had aligned my thoughts with the thoughts of the UN Special Rapporteur on Solidarity, right? That this quagmire does not end for me until it ends for all of us. So we can't suspend the right for a few, attain it for a few, because then we are not safe and we are not fine. Thank you very much, Azu. Petronel, you had a few remarks and then we can close this off. Um, thank you very much, Michael. I mean, I just want to maybe add two things because I find the discussion that we've been having so interesting. Um, but my first comment is, you know, on forcing the judiciary to move to, you know, electronic platforms. And I do intend to use the word force. We have to remember that while judicial officers are held in high esteem, they're also civil servants and they, you have to keep up with the time. So it's not something that they should elect to do. It is something that would be mandatory and it has to be communicated as such. And I think the way in which to target perhaps more conservative, all the members of the judiciary would be through judicial support staff. Um, and, you know, almost every country has a system where a judge would have research clerks and court managers, and that would be the access point there. And then just secondly, I want to comment on the issue of, you know, releasing prisoners. Um, I think we should also, you know, not forget the nuance that I think whenever we're talking about, you know, potential early release or focusing on cautions or bail, that this would not qualify for every category of offenders. This will be for you know, petty offenders or for lower level offenders. I'm, I'm pretty sure and maybe I'm wrong, um, but I don't think anyone's advocating for, you know, 
uh, murderers and rapists to be released. But you know, we should ask ourselves the question, if someone um, stole or shoplifted, is the, the adequate response to leave them in a jail where they might be faced with death? Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. And thank you very much to our discussants um, for your very incisive uh, views on, 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 the, on the topic. Very grateful for your time. Um, I think we, we would end it here. Uh, we, we wish that we could go on and on and on because these are issues that impact on a lot of communities. And I'm sure as human rights uh, advocates and activists and people who are interested in human rights generally, we, we want to talk about these issues. But um, we're grateful for your time, for all the participants that uh, came through today, those who left, those who are still with us. Um, we hope that this was engaging enough and that uh, you learned something new and engage with, with the topic as sufficiently as you would have wished. Um, just to also let you know that we, we, we're recording this particular session and all the other sessions and a, a link to the video would be made available on the center's uh, website so that if you want to um, actually have a recap of the things that we discussed here or if you want to share the video with other colleagues who were unable to join us but who might be interested in the discussions that uh, occurred here today, the, the, the link would be available to them for, for, for uh, access. So uh, on that note, um, we would uh, be on the round three next week, right, Thursday on the 7th of May. Uh, we would share the topics and the, the discussions with you and um, give you the opportunity to sign up uh, to be part of the next the discussion. With them. I would like to say on behalf of the Center for Human Rights and on my own behalf, we thank you very much for making time and participating and for your insightful presentations, questions and comments. Um, we, will, we, will, we will end it here. Uh, I wish you all a good day and stay safe. Wash your hands. And keep that child in school. Bye-bye. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right.